We are recording in progress, and this is the Enterprise Agile Global Community. Uh, uh, we have a good crowd here tonight. Uh, our we want to thank our sponsor. So we have a sponsor, Miro, which is used to be real time board in the old days, uh, in the early days. Uh, it's been Miro for quite a while now, five or six years, I think. Um, and uh, and a wonderful tool for uh, a wonderful tool for agile, a wonderful tool for doing retrospectives, a wonderful tool for doing relative sizing of uh, of stories, um, a, a, a great tool. Uh, Miro is Miro is sponsoring the Enterprise Agile Global Community. Uh, we've been around through uh, three name changes, I think. Uh, and I was and I was just looking at I was looking at emails from Gateway to Agile, which is what we were originally, and then Enterprise Agile San Francisco, and then with the pandemic, Enterprise Agile, Agile Global Community. Um, and that allowed me to be in Seattle and call in, and that allows Jay to be in in uh, India, Indiana and call in and be our speaker tonight. Uh, and so we've had speakers literally from around the world during the pandemic and uh, literally from around the world and continuing continuing to do that from far off realms like India, Indianapolis <laughs> or, or, or Carmel, Indiana, as they uh, as they call Carmel out there. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, Jay started this thing. Uh, he uh, nabbed a whole bunch of us to help out. Uh, and, uh, and we formed a cabal, and all of you are welcome to join the cabal. All you have to do is say, "Yeah, I'll help." And uh, and the cabal meets um, once, roughly once a month on on another evening, and uh, <laughs> and uh, enjoys uh, enjoying each other actually, uh, and trying to figure out who to have next. Uh, Jay volunteered for this one, and I don't think it's presented. I think it presented a year ago, maybe. On uh, um, on diversity, basically um, uh, neural neurodiversity, if I recall correctly, and tonight he's going to give us a, uh, a case study on uh, project structure and product agility. So, uh, Jay, what did I miss? Naturally, nice. intros. Okay, so take it away, Jay. All right, cool. So let's see with my technical wizardry here. I'm going to uh, share my screen and see if it actually works. Can you see my screen now? Excellent. All right. So welcome everybody. And 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 uh, Gopal and Ron is, are going to watch the chat. And and you know I I changed the security profiles because we had a a lot of hacks and I, you know, locked it down. Now I'm opening it up. So just open up uh, your, 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 your speaker and talk if you want to. And uh, uh, I like it to be very interactive. Otherwise I'll pontificate forever, but I have a few slides to go through and share with you this whole notion of moving from project to product. It's a hot thing nowadays. Uh, uh, many, many companies in the world are doing it. So I, I would like to share with you some ideas and some practicality of doing it. So now let's test this. Cool. Did it go to the next slide for y'all? All right, cool. So I, I Many years ago, I found this. I don't know who did this imaging, but I, I really like the image, and the you know the, the little fish jumping to the next tank, getting pushed out by the other fish. So, a product organization for many companies, especially companies that's been around for a long time, it's a fearless plunge, and it's it's a significant change. So let's talk about it. So first, let's talk about where the heck we are at. So where the heck we are at right now is tech rules the world. Uh, oh, yeah, you can't see that. Paradigm shift. So it looked really good on mine. 
So it's a, a major paradigm shift, you know, you know GNAI, AI, ML, everything, all that, all that's going on the compute, quantum compute, you know, uh, a lot of cool things are happening. At the same time, it's disrupting everything. And just, just this is some data on on what's going on on the compute environment. I think the big thing is the data, the data changes that are happening. And I'm going to pull up my my phone here and pull this out. Every you know, few years, you know, I'm old. I'm 66 years old. I've lived through a lot of decades when it comes to digital storage and, and capacity. And I remember gigabytes and and so forth. But now we're in the zettabytes world. Okay, we're past pentabytes, people. We are in the zettabytes. And a zettabyte is is a billion terabytes. So it's 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 two to the seventieth power. That's where we're at right now. We have we have basically tons tons of data, and and that's very interesting because I I think right now, especially with Gen AI and the new AI ops that's coming out and everything, data is kind of the center of the universe because that's how Gen AI works with with large language models. So I'm gonna I'm guessing, along with all the other pundits that this is going to be a huge paradigm shift and we're going to see a lot of changes in the world. Then I want to talk about business models and the shifting and the value chains and the market and all this cool stuff. So most of us know VUCA, which is, you know, volatile uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And that's about all about adapt adaptability and flexibility. But there's a new thing now. I don't know if y'all have heard about it. It's been around for a little bit. It's called Banny. And Banny is brittle, anxious, and nonlinear, incomprehensible. <laughs> so, so what we're saying, we're moving from VUCA to Banny. And, and that's where we have to be, you know, very innovative. You know, that now we have innovative measurements. Every company has to be innovative or they die. And they have to be uh, aware of, of emerging trends. So, oh, cool, that popped up. So, so that's an important concept now. We move from you know being volatile and complex and ambiguous to now to nonlinear and incomprehensible stuff, which basically what they're saying there as we're moving into the complexity world. And I'll talk more about that. So I thought I thought this was some interesting shifts of of uh, thinking. So we're, we're going from more from system thinking to complexity science thinking is is basically the notion here. Tell us, tell us what Bonnie is again, Jay. Uh, so Bonnie is brittle, anxious, nonlinear, and incomprehensible. Does that like summarize the world from from COVID? <laughs> so, so, and and the difference there is that when we come out with VUCA, VUCA they were trying to say that we have to be adaptable, flexible, very good for agile. Now with this new brittle, anxious, nonlinear, and comprehensible world, now we're saying, yeah, we have to do the VUCA stuff, but now we also have to be very aware of innovation and, and emerging trends like Gen AI. So if you're not taking Gen AI and, and the new Gen AI, uh, AI ops into your organization and figuring out how to apply it, you're going to be behind. That's basically the bottom line. And these are and that changes our economies and these are just examples of that so this notion is product thinking so product thinking is different we're moving from the project or anything and, and look i was part of pmi for many many years and helped many companies move from non-project oriented structures and organizations to project oriented structures and organizations well now you know, like life changes and the world changes, and now it's it's more about products and product thinking. So it's products and services. Even ITIL version four talks about products and services and and organizational structures around that. Um, those people in Northern California know this very well. That you know the product organizational structure and product thinking kind of dominates everything, and these are the notions of 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 a product uh, way of thinking and how agility fits into it. And so this is an old kind of realization of, of the benefits and the needs. But if you see a, 
um, on the left hand side, that's still critical today. You know, customer centricity and customer satisfaction is key. But now we're moving more to internal products. I'll talk about that. External products, most people know about those and can, can put their heads around it. When we move into companies and organizations and move into a product way of thinking in organizations and we start developing internal products, that's where it's kind of complicated. It's kind of difficult for some people to get their minds around that. We want to increase market share, of course, that increase revenue, you know, competition and, and value to market, short time to market, all that cool stuff. So what we're trying to see now, and this is an experiment, I think, is how organizations can then apply external products that we're used to, and I'll talk about it in a minute, and then organize around what we call internal products. So how many people uh, how many people out there know Silicon Valley Product Group and Marty Kagan? Yay! <laughs> it's cool. So, so Marty and them came up with a notion with Roman Pitchler and others, and they said, well, you know, there's product discovery and product delivery. Product discovery, you know, typically from developing an external product, you're, so, you're going to sell to your customer. You do the market gap analysis. You figure out what the customer wants, and you do a lot of discovery to figure out uh, how you can build a solution uh, to supply the customer demand. And there's a lot involved with with product discovery, and you'll see some of this. So, you know, uh, Marty came up with dual track. Uh, development or, or it's really dual track product and and the whole discovery track and development track and that was I don't know how how many years ago was that that was a few years ago that Marty came up with that and it's kind of taken off a little bit now and there's different variations of this where we have to do some discovery and figuring out things and then after we figure out enough we go and build it and deliver it, and we do MVPs and and so forth. So so that was the notion here. Then there was another notion that uh, Jeff Gethoff and others have and have done as well as organizations to say, well, you know, they're they're not really discrete ways of doing and working. They they have to integrate. So we have to do product discovery and product delivery, delivery, product delivery in parallel. There's some synchronization with that. So there was a lot of conversations many of us had over the time that said, well, is it really a sequential serial type of thinking and working, or is it you do some stuff at the beginning and then once you get going, there's some synchronization and parallelization that you have to do. So now the notion is that even if I do some product discovery and I have some product and operate uh, pro production and operations, I still have to continuously do discovery so that I grow and evolve the product and or at least new product features, new enhancements and so forth. So this is that dual track uh, kind of thinking. And then we came up with this whole notion of back in the day, dual track scrum. And I'm not going to go into it, but, it, but Jeff Gethoff and others kind of came up with this notion of how you can do scrum in this, this kind of discovery delivery mode. And a lot of co companies and organizations do that. But, you know, if I look at this and I take a step back, you know, from a product universe, you know, we have product development. We have a, the company perspective because the company has to make money. It has to survive. It has to make profit, revenue, all that cool stuff. It also has to serve the customer, serve the market. They have to grow the market. And at the same time, they have to have a bunch of teams inside the organization that do product development, develop the systems, the business processes, you know, the uh, and so forth so that the product lives and breathes forever. So the notion here, the difference between a project, you know, a project has a beginning and end, and it's generally finite. It's very short term, beginning and end. A product is generally lives a longer time. Products do, most products do eventually die or they're replaced or 
or whatever, but products have a much longer lived uh, existence than a project. So the notion here is that we wanna develop a product organization where we have product dedicated teams that support the product and not the short-lived construction period of time. So Jay, you've got uh, Andy with his hand up. Oh, go Andy. Uh, I'm just wondering if you can make the um, your screen display a little bit bigger. For oh. for me, it's it's kind of use, using oh. a, a small part of the screen. Ah, so hold on a minute. You have a super wide monitor. Yeah, that's the problem. So hold on a minute. Yeah, and I haven't been so I got it fixed on my Windows. Are you sharing your screen? Are you sharing your screen or are you sharing PowerPoint? I'm sharing the screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to share the PowerPoint slide. Okay, so hold on. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, there's there's a lot of content on those slides, Jay. I know. I'm 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 gonna speed through it. Ignore the content and just listen to me. Yeah, we sort of want to we sort of want to look at that that little note about Marty Kagan down there in the corner. Or, oh, okay. Or, so, or what, those, what those bubbles? What those bubbles say? They're exactly. All, they're all in uh, two point type at this point. Okay, so let's see if this helps. Nope. Nope. All right, stop stop sharing. No, you want you want to a little bit. No, you were doing well. What you need to do is just switch which one's which. So go ahead and put it back into PowerPoint mode. Okay. I am in PowerPoint mode. So no, so. I know, but go ahead and, and share it with us. Okay. Oh, okay. Hold on. Thank you, Pam, for doing tech support. Thank you. Oh, it's okay. I'm only I'm I only do this like you know twenty times a day. So wow, it's not letting me change this. Oh, there it goes. Finally came up. All right. So are you saying go so back to share what share whatever you've got? Okay. Is that better? Nope. No, that's back to sharing. You were sharing the the screen. I need you to share a PowerPoint. Yeah, that's what I picked. Apparently, that's that isn't working. Whatever out. you did last time was better, and then we just have to. We're gonna there, go. There in may this. there may be two PowerPoint apps you can pick from. One is the presentation. No, what happened? Is he, what was showing us? Right. Okay. Yeah, this, okay. This is presentation oh, there, swap mode. Displays. That's what you need. All right. Up in the top left. Okay. There we go. You yeah. end show swap displays. Click there. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, there you go. Bingo. Yay. Thank you, Pam. You're Thank welcome. you, Pam. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to move the Zoom thing into the other monitor then. All right, cool. So you can see it better now? Yes. All right. So let me go back. Let me go back down here. Thank you. All right. Let me go back here. Let me go back here. So Marty, Marty Kagan. This is his deal. He invented it. Kudos credit. Uh, then also uh, others like Jeff Gotthive and, and um, many others, including Roman Picture and everything, worked together to do this, which is great. This is phenomenal. That this changed a lot of things with Mind the Product and SVPG and others. This is a picture. I forgot who did this picture, but I liked it kind of looking at it from a different angles, different perspectives, different lenses. Now, I want to talk about the difference between internal products and external products. We all know external products, okay? That's what we sell to our customers. That's what brings revenue in. That's the P&L, right? So there's some examples of external products. But I believe, and there's people that disagree with me, that there are the notion of internal products inside large organizations. And there's some examples I put down there. And this is the notion of the definition of an internal product. So what we're trying to organize around there is people teams 
people processes and text what we're doing here and organizing them into a collection or a group that is representative of a product that the end user the company's end users use to run the company okay and there's some definitional terms there but i'm going to go a little a little more detail on top of the notion of internal and external products, we have the notion of novel products, brand new, innovative internal products that never existed before. Gen AI is a very example. I would argue that they're not really a product or a product feature or a set of capabilities. And then you have the existing organizational structure, you know, uh, keeping the lights on and running it. And that's what I kind of refer to as existing products where we're trying to take the organizational structure that exists today and change it and modify it to a product organizational structure. And there's also a hierarchy to this. And, and a lot of companies have, have adopted this hierarchy. A lot of companies, banks, insurance companies, Wells Fargo kind of adopted this and, and many other organizations. And, and they kind of come up with this hierarchy. And this hierarchy is more for an, from an organizational design. Notice that that's a st strategic portfolio management or lean portfolio management. If you're, if you're a safe person and all the OKRs kind of feed this product structure and this product thinking. So the first level is the product line. The product line is the P&L. So in a bank, you have commercial and retail banking. On the retail banking side, you're going to have home loans. Home loans is a P&L for a bank. Okay, that's the highest level. Then within that, we kind of create product groups or product areas just because of the organizational structure and, and to reduce the span of control and span of management. Uh, we have, you know, these product groups that are aligned to end-to-end -to -end user journeys or customer journey. And then within those, we have products. So, for example, I have, you know, home loans. Well, in a product group, you may have VHA loans, uh, VA loans, and so forth that are different product groups because there are very different business rules, customers, and stuff. They may share the same systems, though. And they may have different systems, tech systems. And, and then you'll have the product, the specific products that you're selling. As an example, insurance companies have been doing products for many years, and they're kind of organized in this, in this fashion. And then within the products is where we look at value streams and, and architecture. I'll talk a little bit more about domain-driven design and C4 model, which fits very well with this kind of construct. Here is the, this is, the, I would say, the meat and potatoes of everything. And uh, the current company I'm working at, we're kind of evolving this and, and, and figuring out how to implement it. But this is typical implementation that we do at many companies when they say, hey, we want to go to this product way of organizing and, and thinking and ways of working. Well, we have to really think of how we're going to make this change, this transition. And, and, it, and depending upon the company, this is not trivial. This is ripe with politicalness and ripe with you know, uh, other stresses and, and, and so forth to the organization. Matt, can I make a comment here? Sure. Okay, so sorry, this, this, I've just been through like two years of doing this stuff. Yay! Yeah. And and it just strikes me like the people we work with on the dev side, mm -hmm. they have zero like product. How do I put it? They they don't think product. Right. They don't think product at all. And and just right. getting them to do that is just like it's like a mind transplant. <laughs> it's like pulling teeth, right? It's right. pulling, yeah. It's like, but I did this feature. It's like, who cares? And just 
getting them to acknowledge that someone has to care about something you do is just phenomenally difficult. Okay, there you go. I'll get off my <laughs> my little <laughs> whatever. Well, they, 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 they used to work in COBOL and now they still do. <laughs> kinda, kinda. <laughs> it could have been worse. It could have been a similar VSE. Oh, geez, Louise. So, okay. so that, that, that's actually a good subject for a future talk is, you know, how do you get your introverted developers to care about the product? Ah, ah. that's a good question. And I actually going to talk about that. Cool. And I don't have the answer to everything, y'all. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about it. So first, let me tell you. So when I present this to people, especially executives and leaders, the first thing they tell me is this is too much, too complicated, too complex, simplify it. I go, okay, I'm going to simplify it for you, but you still have to do all this. Okay, you, you, you can't get a you, you can't get away from creating a sausage factory. Okay. Now, at the same time, this is contextual. So every organization I work with, it really depends upon their current state, to your point, where they're at, the people that are involved, how they think, and so forth. So that prep and define stage or part of the work here is is critical that's where we really find out what's going on okay then the design model organize and launch is con you know, we customize it and tailor it for what works at, at the time to get them to move the needle or or to move forward but these are typical things that i would argue that are important for an internal product definition and discovery if I if I can't develop a product vision and strategy, if I don't understand who my end users are and their personas, if I don't have good OKRs and KPIs, if I don't have a good strategic architecture, then I can't go much further. I mean, those to me are critical things that we have to figure out together and collaboratively. Okay, and 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 it's and it's difficult. So think about it. If I'm in a company and I'm working with the infrastructure team, okay, or the typical IT team that's supporting infrastructure, you know, cloud or 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 or, or office tools or or Jira tools and so forth, how do they determine and define what their product is and set of services to support the product? And how do they organize their people so they have dedicated people around their product? and they have product leaders and technical leaders. Those are difficult things to figure out for many, many companies. Now, some companies, it's it's easy. Like like I said, you know, if, if I talk about home loans with banks, you know, they can kind of figure that out, right? But if I go deeper into the bowels of, of, of a large company and organization, it becomes more difficult because you're further and further away from the customer. So your customer is really the end user or the the employees of the company is 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 what your product is servicing, right? So all these things that you listed here are contextual. It doesn't mean you have to do all of these. It really depends on on where they're at and and the and the specific contextual element uh, that you're dealing with, right? But these are typical things I find that you know you have to have a good argument of why you wouldn't do value stream identification map. You have a good argument why why wouldn't I have to do have a product vision and a mission uh, for for my organization, right? Uh, a lot of people, once you start having those conversations with them and saying we have to do this to your point, they can't really uh, disagree that you you shouldn't have these things. A lot of times it's about, well, the train's going, you know, a thousand miles down the track. Do we have time to, to do this? And my answer is always, do you have time not to do this? Okay, just like we talked about before, the, the landscape of the world is changing and Gen AI is going to change a lot of things. You, you're going to have to figure out how to do this so that you can operate 
at, at the most efficient way of your organization. So this is the approach I generally take with organizations. And I've been successful with many companies and failed with some. So I'll just be honest with you all. So I'm currently uh, uh, experimenting with this and, and implementing it at the company I work for. This is another version of it. There's different ways. This is one key thing I found out. You have to have multiple views and simplicity with your different target audiences, executives, direct reports to executives, technical leaders, business leaders, IT. You have to have different views of the same reality, of the same paradigm for those, those individuals. So this is another view. That's all this is. It's doing the same thing, but it's talking about uh, how we're gonna do these things. And it has templates and it has uh, accelerator to help them do the work. You still need to have people with experience to walk them through that and, and mentor them and coach them to do this if, it, if they've never done it before, right? But the cool thing now, over the last two decades, there's tons and tons of stuff out there. If you go to you know, YouTube and Google and search, you know, product vision, if you search Roman Pitchler, you search Silicon Valley Product Group, if you search Mind the Product and so forth, you're going to get a lot of cool stuff that you can use to help people along the journey. So this is another view. This is another view. So here's another view that uh, I've taken and and another look of, of how you could you could do this. So just keep that in mind. You really have to be cognizant of the individuals that you're working with, the culture you're working with, and the organizational structure that you're working with, and try to figure out what resonates with them, how you can communicate where they can take it in, absorb it, and get rid of, you know, some of their biases. I, I you know, you're not never going to get rid of cognitive biases and so forth, but you can still help support them to move and, and, and think through new ways of, you know, thinking or working. But vision board, those who know Roman pictures and everything, this is not his vision board, but it's similar. I would say go to Roman and I love his vision board and his his way of doing stuff. That's the first thing I work with people is to come up with the product vision and product strategy and the goals. And we work through that collaboratively to define those things and then determine the product and product features. We do a vision creation. You know, this you is have, sorry, you know do you um, yeah. issues with people aligning their work to this vision because sometimes you end up with like they're building a bunch of stuff right and the question really is why exactly okay exactly and i'm going to talk about that so i really like right. <laughs> jeff's lean lean ux canvas i'll talk about that in a minute so you align the the why and the and the rationale and make sure that you're you're really doing stuff that relates to the business goals and and the strategic goals, right? So you're delivering value based on that. But I'm going to talk about that. So this is a vision creation. These are examples. You can go. There's many of them. This is just one. I don't necessarily like this whole long thing for a customer. You need a statement. You don't need to do all that. It's just I'm I'm a big believer in simplicity. Once you start over engineering things and over complicating things, you're going to lose people. You know, there's you're just not going to go along with you. Okay, but I like the idea here that the vision and strategy are linked. You you need to work through that and define it. You need to have an elevator pitch. Everybody on the team, even the developer. Even the Java coder needs to understand the product vision statement, the elevator pitch. It's key. Everyone needs to really understand why we're here. What are we doing? What's the purpose? Okay. And, 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 and what's their, the work that they're going to do connect to that purpose? Exactly. Exactly. You know, what, what value am, am I providing right 
got Andy with his hand up again, or it did for a moment. Oh. There. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, just a real quick thing. I would always tell my developers or anybody on my team, if you step into the elevator with a senior executive, a CEO in the morning, and mm -hmm. he goes, hey, what are you working on? You should be able to tell him what you're working on, and he should know what you're working on. Yes. And, and you should walk out of the elevator both feeling like, oh, that guy's working on something important. Mm -hmm. Or I know I'm working on something important because the mm -hmm. CEO agrees. You know, the worst thing would be is if the developer tells the CEO, I'm working on this, and the CEO goes, what the fuck is that? Exactly. <laughs> oh, and sorry, I shouldn't be clear, but, you know. Um, <laughs> That's how you know that you're working on something important. Right. And you, if you can do that. <laughs> and then I, I remember telling developers that and they get a scared look on their face. Oh, I got to talk to the CEO. Right. Well, yeah. and that's important too. You know, we'll talk a little bit about that is we have to recognize that every human being has strengths and weakness. Right. And if someone has a weakness on your team, it's, in my opinion, it's my responsibility to help them overcome those weaknesses and do the strength, right? So let's, we'll talk about that. So I, I, I like this slide because the important thing here is that everybody on the team knows what the vision is and, and they can articulate it and they can do the elevator. Everybody and, and the developer, when they or come up with a choice having to make a trade-off they have a good idea of which way to make the trade-off exactly and it shouldn't just be the product owner knows that right it's everybody on the team i like jeff godhives and 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 others that work with him's lean ux canvas i like this a lot i i've walked people through this what the business problem is, what the business outcome is, you know, and everything. And we get down to number seven. What is the most important thing we can learn first? And then number eight, what's the least amount of work we can do to do this important thing, like prototype or whatever, right? The hypothesis is critical, you know, because everything we do, OKRs to me, is just a list of hypothesis and, and key results and outcomes that you want want to deliver but i really like uh jeff's uh look work on this and there's, and there's a product strategy campus i love you know um roman pitchler's uh vision canvas and his whole vision strategy process so i use that a lot and get the team together and and and, and fill in all this stuff right and it's a lot of conversations and a lot of thinking right Business and IT together as one team thinking through this. So we do this, the product vision, eventually it becomes a backlog and we do an MVP and, and all that cool stuff. And uh, product features, I really believe in, in product feature releases and product feature development. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's a different way of organizing everything. I really believe in customer journeys, customer empathy, and personas. I like them. I don't know what you all think, but I think that's an important part of, of a product definition and a product mindset. What do you all think? Just a question for y'all. You think this is important to customer journey personas? Uh, I'm gonna. I don't know if I'm gonna disagree, but I'm gonna make this more nuanced. Okay. I think a lot of internal um, organizations they don't need like like when I do marketing and I have like a my own product and everything else. I need more of a full blown persona, right? Mm -hmm. But. You could do like uh, empathy maps, you know, you could do like the shortcut ones. Mm -hmm. I think for most of them, I think it's the, the developers get their arms around it faster, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it just, it makes life easier because I think personas look like too much like hard work for them. So, so sorry, Pam, what, what makes it easier? 
What, what do they well, get there? Use like a, an empathy map or um, a value proposition canvas. Mm -hmm. I think you get 85% of what you need. And the other 15%, especially for internal products, doesn't make a difference. Yeah. I, I, personally. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what, what, what I'm finding out now is as I found some value taking time to, for example, um, thinking about the developer's journey. So a developer at a company, what's their journey? What's the different types of developer personas? So, so an AI ML developer persona would be different than, than an SAP developer's persona. And what would their journey look like especially if they're doing DevOps tool chain. Okay. So, yeah, so that's, and I, I hear, I hear what you're saying. And we don't have to get to the level of detail we have to get to with a customer, you know, journey and customer personas, right? Mm -hmm. but, but at the same time, if we could spend just a little time to understand our employees and their journey and, 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 and their empathy, right? Yeah, and that I th and then document and get you know concurrence. I think that's I'm I'm starting to see some value in doing that. Yeah, yeah. I I just think that you know I don't need developers to get like an MBA, right? right. I need right. them. I need them to be able to operate. I mean, seriously, just getting them to list who their users are in mm -hmm. a persona form. You know, like even you know. Uh, Sorry, I'm working with the MTA right now. So we end up with like uh -huh. people who do like uh we we get subway writers, that's external, but we also have internal would be like uh people who write reports. Uh -huh. uh, it's, it's dumb stuff, but just getting them to list that is like a big deal. They haven't thought about it. Ah, but see that yeah. we, that's we, important. We take them along to meet the people who write reports that we're writing the software for. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um idea of like turning the table if the developers don't seem to care who the who the user is um turning turning the table on them and said let's say we're writing software for a developer and if i said i have a user story that is as a, as a developer i need to have a very efficient front end to be able to check in my code or whatever they would get it really quickly that not all developers are the same and they should be asking the question like, what type of user? Who is this? Is this a, a prover? Is this a power user? Is it a, a low level user, you know, restrictive, whatever a case might be, um, maybe kind of uh, turn the tables on them a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important. So I, I use a, a personas and empathy mapping to get people to understand the other person to live in their shoes to to think and care about the human equation right so if we can do that and then they start caring and they start thinking like oh well should we do this is is karen gonna really care about this let's talk about this i don't know just think about it if the developers in a meeting and someone says yeah we need to do this because this is the requirement and we we need to have this kind of UI thing to and then, uh, to do this. And if the developer spoke up and said, "Well, wait a minute," would they really care about that, or is there another way we could do this to make their life better? No, oh. I think I think I think it also allows them to push back on. Mm -hmm. I think this is the next best idea, and they go, "Well, so and a Karen." wouldn't do this right <laughs> so we get around the hippo issue too exactly mm -hmm. but 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 the, here's the double-edged sword here that means that we have to have our team whether developers product owners whoever testers what well, i don't care what they are they have to have some exposure to the end user and the customer they got to have to have the ability to, to understand them Right? Mm -hmm. They 
have no exposure to them, they have no way to understand them, then, then that's a huge problem. I've seen that uh, in two different scenarios in recent years where there are so many people between the development team and the customer that it, it, levels of abstraction are just too great. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And it puts the team at such a disadvantage. And then I've seen the other scenario. I worked at StubHub. Every single developer could be a customer. They could either buy or sell tickets. They could go through, mm -hmm. they could be the persona that they're writing a story for. Right. And they don't, they aren't, they don't even have an account to log into. <laughs> they don't right. care about buying tickets. They didn't care about selling tickets. They never even went through the experience themselves. And it was right there in front of them. Could you imagine working at Amazon and never shopping for an Amazon oh, product? That's so sad. Yeah. That's so sad. I don't care. Yeah. Exactly. So 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 I'm I'm just saying we could correct all that. Right? And we can have the executives and leaders of these companies involved to say, look, this is important. And we have to have some way, some ability to expose everyone to some level of the customer in you so they can understand, they can feel, right? So that's, that's what we've got. So Dennis has his hand up and then Doug. Oh, all right, go ahead. Yeah, hi. So you were talking about the cross-functional teams, right? So yeah, you were mentioning that in, in the slides. So mm -hmm. people from business, maybe other mm -hmm. uh, domain, uh, knowledge domains together. So this type of thing actually could be a part of a platform for communication between these different type of knowledge uh, domains, people from business, people from IT. So when you have, for example, like a uh, empathy map or these personas, uh, this actually uh, is an artifact that a more effective communication between these two different knowledge domains can happen, you know? Exactly. Yeah. It's a conduit. Yes. So, so are you, when you create these things, do you get a bunch of people together? Do you get cross-functional teams together or do you just let the business people do it? No, we have cross-functional multidisciplinary teams and there's a difference, okay? You need to have both. Okay. You had a you had a slide a minute ago that had a picture of a bunch of developers mm -hmm. and stakeholders and uh, that were, were they were they the ones creating this this persona and creating the so yeah. I think that was I think that was Pamela's question. Yeah. So what happens in a lot of companies and and we're I'm starting to see the skills and the and the competencies uh, evolve and disperse, but originally. What started is that the UX team and the CX team and the UI team had this conference. So they would work with teams and they would develop the customer end user journey and journey maps and so forth. And they would help the teams develop the personas and they would develop the artifacts and, and, and communicate and go talk to the actual customer and end user and build these artifacts and then bring it back to the team and share it and talk about it and and and, and educate and learn. Verse, and that's a good, that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. But at some point in time, we've got to be able to validate that everyone on the team actually really understands the customer and the end user. And there's a lot of ways you can do that, right? I wanna just pause here. Doug has had his hand up for a long time. Oh, go, Doug, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, Doug. Sorry, my hand was up a, a while back. Um, my, my experience is entirely different with than whatever I'm hearing this. Um, I, I've been doing, uh, I'm not as old as you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, thank close. You. <laughs> I, I'm close. I'm close. I'm, I'm, the, I, I'm just like a half dozen years behind. And I work with a lot of development teams and I've never worked on a team where the team didn't care about what they oh, were doing. Yay! But, but they get beat into submission uh, by, 
but, but by, uh, but by bad management decisions. Mm-hmm. I've seen parallel teams to mine uh, that, that, that are just like totally crushed by bad product, mm-hmm. by product people. And um, I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I think I'm looking at your slides. I'm going, yeah, this makes sense. But how do you get, there are so many people in middle management that are just trying to protect their space and how it, it, right and um and how, how you can't change their mindset because they're trying to protect their turf they're trying to protect their career they're trying to <clears throat> make sure they still have something to do i don't know what it is it, 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 i think there's a lot of dynamics that make this it, you you have to have the right organization uh the person at the top to really want this to make it happen is what i'm seeing Yep. It, 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 it yeah. can always happen at a team level. It, it, if, if you have a good team and a good team leader, the, the, they can do everything that you're talking about. Talk about the customer, mm-hmm. you make everyone focus on the end user. Um, I, I I know myself, I, um, I, I'm in a small, uh, at, not small biotech, a big biotech, but, but I have a really small team. We, we, we have a, a small little research group that we uh, serve, probably about 600 people. And we, I talked about our users' first names. Everyone knows who, you know, Carmina is and who uh, Jim is and who this person is. And I go, okay, this is it. And, and, and so I inundate my, my, my team with, you know, what these people are trying to do, what they're wanting. But that's because I'm doing it. You go to the next team next to me that's doing some other product, and it's like all they're trying to do is figure out how to do something that's interesting and cool to them. It's it's bizarre. I don't understand it, but that's what I've seen. Anyway, thank you. By, by the way, I I today I did a, a whole thing on psychological safety. Oh yeah. Executive team level because I just know that all these people are just dictating what their team should do. <laughs> I I thought I would just rip the bandaid off. <laughs> yeah. And and you all, you two are pointing out, uh, I have a few more slides to go to, but you are pointing out the crux of this, the crux of this. And, you know, it, it's not, it's, it's just not the frozen middle management. The crux of this is, is the human endeavor for change. Yes, and, yes. And, and the complications that evolve, right? And the politics that evolve, right? And, and, and the way I look at it, you know, since I'm, senior citizen now i look at it like it is what it is it's going to evolve it's probably not going to evolve as fast as i would like it to and and but that's okay they'll get there eventually right and i'm here to help that's the way i that's that's my mental attitude these days so i i i would recommend that you adopt that attitude <laughs> All right, so really quick. So mineral via product, everyone knows about this, but it's really important to me to understand if MVP is release one. And, and we're gonna do this kind of cool stuff to get something out there, whether it's a Wizard of Oz app or whatever, to get the thing out. But the key aspect of this is to learn and adapt. Right, get it out there. Don't be messing around and take two years to get some piece of crap out there. Get something out there really quick and learn from it, right? And then go for it. Now you have to be careful because companies, you know, I work in in, in biofarm and stuff like that. We have to be very careful because if we get something out there too fast, we can actually harm somebody or kill somebody. Right. So so you you have to you know be very careful about that. But I just want to point out MVPs are important, but there's there's a characteristic depending upon your industry you're in and the contextual element that you're in, you have to be more careful. It might take you a little longer to get the MVP out. You're not developing, you know, a browser, right? So just keep that in mind. This is this is a great that was that that was this is a great graphic. Okay, cool. Because just developing a bunch of the platform doesn't deliver an MVP. Right. Exactly. 
Humans are actually using your product. You got to care about the humans. That much, but yes. And, <laughs> and, that's, and that's really and that's really significant. Chun's got his hand up. Go ahead. And I probably mispronounced your name, Chun. Chun, no, 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 that's right. And actually, I think it's a little bit like the vertical slices we see in video games development. So mm -hmm. uh, you you don't, uh, as a vertical slice, you never just uh, uh, give the, for example, the layout of a level. You give um, a, a full, uh, that's why it's called vertical slice. So because, yes, it's functional, but it's also, it looks like what we think the prototype will look like. So it's a segment of the game is not just a level, like not just, for example, just the, the design or just the characters. It's, it has a little bit of everything, including the emotional design to see the response of the, the person who will test it. Exactly. And we're going to talk a little about that. Uh, those who know domain di driven design and C4 model that helps us do this. But we'll talk about that. And I love you all. You all, you all are getting this really good. Cool. Now, the other thing I bring to the table is the Canavan framework. As are all y'all familiar with the Canavan framework and Dave Snowden? Nope. Nope. So I'm going to talk about it. I don't know how to speak Welch. I don't know how to do that either. So there you go. <laughs> so, so Dave and I go way back. We're both ex, ex IBMers. And uh, and Dave and left IBM before I did, but he started another company. He's he 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 lives in Wales, and uh, he's and he developed the Canavan framework, and I'll show you what that means anywhere. But this is all about complexity science. Okay, so remember I said before we move from VUCA to Bonnie, and it's all about complexity now and complexity science and being aware of the emerging properties and tech that's coming out and how to apply it. And every time you turn your head, there's a new thing that's coming out, right? So he developed this whole framework. Uh, he called it at the time, a decision model. And he released it from the Harvard Business Review. And, and both of us had issues with IBM leadership at the time. And he came out with this, and and like you know, most most companies, you know, uh, they didn't realize how important this was. So if you look up uh, Canavan and Dave Snowden, you'll see his company. And I like what we did. So this is I'm not going to go into this. this. Is like you know, he's, this complexly adaptive systems theory and complex science. He has a PhD. He's all about knowledge and, and complexity science and cognitive sciences but here's his notion and it's changed so it's 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 the typical if you if you look at it it looks like a neuron <laughs> a human neuron in the brain and what he basically thought about uh, and worked with several people to do this he basically organized our thinking and how we apply uh, our problem solvings into like four major domains. The obvious domain, which he's changed now to simple, is uh, this is best practice, we know this. I mean, you could do waterfall and project management in this. This is like manufacturing. You do the same thing over and over again. You can do lean on this and decision management system and, and you just wanna be very repetitive, you know it. Then, there's a complicated domain. The complicated domain is a little bit more difficult to wrangle than the obvious domain. Uh, the obvious domain, if you think about this, uh, we've uh, we figured stuff out and it, and and we can repeat it, and it's obvious. It, it's it's lean, like lean manufacturing. Complicated domain is a little bit less. Uh, we're still figuring stuff out. Okay. But it's complicated in the sense that we have a lot of uh, sense and analysis and respond. We have to still figure some things out. And this is where Agile works pretty well in, in Scrum and, and so forth, because we're doing things iteratively and incrementally to figure things out. But 
we kind of know the problem domain and the solution is it's it, it, it's very little unknown. Then you move into the complex domain. Complex domain is more unknowns than knowns. Okay, complex domain is very different than the complicated domain. COVID-19, for example, was a complex domain that in, impacted the world. So on the complex domain, we have to do a lot of probing and sensing, responding, a lot of experimentation, and a lot of multiple parallel uh, experiments and prototypes uh, to figure out the emergent reality. Where emergent reality means that when we're involved, into the system that we're working with, with system thinking, the sheer fact that we're involved with it changes the system. It's emergent and we do not know how that will change the system. Then there's the chaotic. The chaotic is where uh, we are coming up with no novel practices and so forth, but we don't want to stay in the chaotic very long. The chaotic is sometimes uh, we put ourselves into it on purpose. So chaos engineering, anyone that uh, know about chaos engineering and chaos monkey, that is purposely intentionally creating chaos to see how the organization and systems respond to the chaos. If I bring down the system and I'm in Amazon and I cause problems to certain Networks, you know, how does the system react? Did I create the necessary components and a bit, uh, rules, code to react to the chaos that's created? Questions? You really explain this to your customers or is this just something we no. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> I'd be terrified to explain this to the people I work with. I explain it to people like us. Okay, Ooh. good. Thank you. <laughs> so we we have to engineer change. So we have to really think about how how we organize and and our brain and how we think. So I like Dave. I know Dave very well. And I like how he's organized this. It really helps me. Now, what I have done with some executives and people in, in organizations, I didn't go through all the stuff that I talked about, but I did kind of relate to them these differences in thinking. So when I talk to certain people in medical science or pharmaceutical companies and scientists, scientists work in the complex domain. They do the scientific method. That's, that's what they do. 90% of all their work is the unknown. They're trying to figure it out. So they get it. So it really depends upon your audience is, 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 and, and, and how you communicate it, I guess, is, is my reaction to that. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I actually think that uh, probably most CEOs would would it would be eye opening for them, but for most of the people who report to them, not so much. <laughs> right, and we have to be careful because you're correct. Um, we can't overwhelm the brain. It's it's funny that you say that, Ron, because I think a lot of man managers that hire team members expect them to have the skills, knowledge, learning to be able to solve all problems. And they won't acknowledge that they're not hiring people that can't solve their problems. But uh, the reality is work is complicated and we need experts. Work is complex. We need learning. We need understanding. We need time to figure it out. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, I, I think a great example of the, um, of the different uh, and, and and Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a great example of complicated versus complex on the complicated side, software engineering is complicated. It's not it's not obvious. Using Agile for it is way better than using um, a waterfall in project management. 
Well, on the complex side, and, and this is this, and this question comes up in, in agile trainings I do every once in a while. Somebody says, you know, I'm in data science. What should we be doing? And and data science, it's do an experiment, do an experiment, retrain the model, retrain the model, retrain the model. Exactly. And, and that's what and that's what we do in the in the complex world is mm -hmm. is we're constantly testing, even to see if there's an answer, because right. we don't know that, that even that there's an answer. Uh, Kelly's got a, uh, a hand up here. Yeah, so so one of the things that I've done to help explain this is for leaders who are um, understanding that they need to change their business model, but they don't understand where they are today. And so what happens is they get stuck in thinking that, well, I'm only doing complicated work. So therefore, I just need to do stuff that continues to work in that complicated world. And so it kind of opens their mind to think of, oh, no, I'm actually in the more complex or even in some cases, a chaotic world. And so the model kind of helps them understand that maybe where their mental model is, isn't where they want to go. And so helping them see it a little bit differently sometimes helps. But yeah, you're right. It, it depends on the, the person and kind of what they're trying to achieve and how much they want to absorb. But it is a good model. I used it a lot, too. Yes, and 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 you you do have to be careful with this. Uh, so everything I'm talking about today, you have to be careful with who you talk to, who you educate, who you train, who you work with inside your organization. Um, and and let's be honest, the people with certain roles and certain responsibilities and certain accountabilities have to learn certain things and others do not and until they reach that part of their career or they get old like me uh, and, the, and the reason the ceos are are more receptive than anyone else is they spend more of their time in the chaotic world right yeah they they're they're bouncing for, and they hire people to do the complex and the complicated so yeah. They have to hire the right people to do those things or their company will not survive. That VUCA thing and Bonnie thing I'm talking about, that's the complex domain. So between the complex and complicated, that's what these little circles mean. They, they, it goes back and forth. It vacillates depending upon the maturity cycle you're in. Okay. Just keep that in mind. For example, Gen AI is really moving from the complex to the complicated domain back and forth, depending on the, on the company and, and the industry that you're in. And you're going to have to have the right people and the right skills to be able to play in both of those domains. I think too, I mean, if I'm looking at this, I think the most important thing is, well, there's tons of important things in here, but it's just understanding which which playing field you're on. Exactly. And I think most people feel like, well, if I just have a process, I'll I'll get through it, right? Exactly. As to how can I just keep learning because I don't know enough yet, right? Exactly. So you have, you know, people are different. So for me, for example, I like working on cool stuff in the complex domain. I like stuff that, you know, when people tell me, oh, we've never done this before. This is the first of the kind. We're, you know, we're we're on the bleeding edge. We're uh, I don't know. No one knows how to do this. No one's ever done it before. That's you're, you're like, sign me up. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But not everybody's like that. Some human beings do not like to be in that world. It's stressful. They hate it. They want to be in the obvious world. We have to recognize that every human is different and every human has a part to play in these worlds and these domains. Does that make sense? And that humans can change. Right. Uh, so I'm neurodivergent. When I first started, I was more 
you know, I was more very left brain analytical and I like logic and the obvious. And then over the time and years, I got more comfortable working in the complicated domain. And I did a lot of cool stuff with NASA and stuff. And then I got more calm, you know, kind of uh, okay with working in the complex domain, doing a lot of experimentation. And then I got okay with working with humans and talking to other people. Because, you know, in my young age, in my 20s and stuff, you know, I coded and did stuff. I, you know, I didn't like people too much, okay? They they distracted me, and I didn't know how to enter. I was not social. But then I learned, and I had to learn and adapt. And I had to probe and sense and respond. I had to force myself to be part of the humanity. And at the same time, be able to say, well, where where is my brain power? Where is my cognitive being the most satisfying? And it eventually ended up in the complex divine uh, domain, but it was it was a journey, y'all. So that that's my personal journey. <laughs> so I'm not going to go on these roles. We got all these roles. So I always thought it was funny when Scrum and Agile came out. They talked about project managers or project owners. I said, that's cool. This was many years ago. But is really companies organized around products? Does everyone really understand what the hell this means? Oh, my God. This is from 280 Group. And it's... Oh, I know. It's, I've, I created this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. But, but I like it. I like this. It works really well. it, it's just one of those things that works well. Yes. And I like it because it kind of like, if I look at the comp complex and complicated domain, it kind of says, okay, I have this person that does this stuff. I have this person that does stuff, but they have to work together. They're a freaking team mm -hmm. and they do certain stuff, right? Now, what I'm seeing evolving now. I have different people in the product domain. So the product, I have people that has to work on the market, the customers, and that's a full-time freaking job, right? And doing the gap analysis and getting the market research and all that. And then I have this PO person that works with the teams that do the product backlog and all that stuff. And for some reason, for a long time, when I talked to product owners, they thought, oh, that's what I do, is I write epics of features, and manage the backlog. And I go, no, product management is a lot more than that. So I like this. So thank you for doing this slide. <laughs> and this is another thing that, okay, I'm a product manager. Here's all the cool stuff I got to do. Part of the product uh, structure and product leadership. This is another slide that I've used before. And I always, this is what I say to everybody when I do this. I say, look, if you're a product manager, a product owner, you are a politician. Do you like that? <laughs> no, I, th I think that's right, actually. <laughs> yeah, you, you, that's your job. You're politics all the time. You're, you, you, you're, you're, the, you're in the middle and you're gluing things. You're making decisions and and you're saying yes and no and maybe and and all that cool stuff, but you got to have the power to do it. That's so. When you say middle management, and I look at executives and stuff nowadays, so a chief product officer to me is a senior vice president in a company, and they own that that product line and product group. Then I go down to the product managers and product owners. They own that interpretation of the strategy down to the teams that are delivering the product and the features, right? And they have to work together as a close family. You know, families don't get along all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I, there's something in here, which I usually say, which is I need to keep people in the boat. Yes. And if they if they fall off the boat, you gotta you know save them. You gotta bring them back on the boat. Yeah, 
Exactly. Or sometimes I've had this situation where I had to let them drown because, you know, they just were causing too many problems. So this is okay. product. <laughs> <laughs> so this is product management. You know, pro uh, those in the product world know that that this whole concept of product and everything started from Procter and Gamble is the marketing world. That's where product or or originated and now it's evolved into the tech or it world and to now organizational structures of companies right so you kind of see this delineation of product management product marketing and 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 how all this works together and to me if i take a product that i'm going to deliver to the market i have to integrate marketing sales engineering right and the actual product creation and development that that to me is a cross-functional team to deliver and support to create the product deliver the product and support the product for life i don't need to go through that so how many of you are familiar with domain driven design and c4 model I suggest you go look it up. So domain-driven design is critical for the technical aspect. So and C4 model is a simplistic version of how to, from an architectural technical point of view, how to model the architecture to support the product. So domain-driven design, those are product domains from a technical architecture point of view. And, and it helps us really identify not only the, the, the technical architecture and structure and how everything works together, but the teams, the teams we got to develop, okay? Whether it's scrum teams or Kanban teams or whatever, how you organize people around the product define the product with the product vision and so forth and the personas and the end users, but also now we're at the level to where, okay, we got the product vision, we got the product strategy, okay? We've got the personas, we understand our customers, we understand our end users. How do we organize the people, the technical people working with the business people around the systems, the technical solutions to support the product. Now, uh, Ellen Gottensteiner, those who know her, this is kind of her approach there, but that's the Zachman's model. Anyone that's familiar with the Zachman model back in the day. I, and then the one over here is the MVP of building the application to do the story mapping and all that junk. I suggest that the future with Gen AI especially, is domain-driven design and C4 model. That's the future. You need to start using that and you need to start integrating that with the product. I'm not gonna, I can do a whole freaking class on that. Okay? So this is what, uh, this is what Eric Evans came up with yeah. 20 plus years ago. And it's evolved. So if you look up domain-driven design and you look up domain-driven design virtual, there's a whole team now. So all those things I'll talk about, the, the lean, the business model canvas and the lean UX, that's part of DDD right now. That mm. whole product, that whole product life cycle that I showed you, I call, you know, that, that product life, that is all part of DDD right now. And they've so, actually... So is Eric Evans still leading? No, no, chart? it's grown. It's grown now. Now it's like uh, it's, it's huge. Now they have a whole culture. Now just go, just look up domain driven design virtual, and then uh, go sign up for it and go into it. It's it's really cool. They've done really good work, and it's kind of a, a collective of people across the world who add to it. And the C4 model is very, I mean, I don't know if you're all familiar with Togaf or Zachman and, and all that stuff. Togaf is from Europe. 
uh, while we're simplicity is important. So that's why I like Kent Beck when I work with him and, and XP and so forth. We we really focus on simplicity and design, right? And and cohesion and co coupling. So C4 model is basically four models. There's a C1, C2, C3, C4. Yeah. Uh, so the contextual model all the way down to the uh, coding models or architecture that people would use is, is, is simple, but at the same time important because it relates to the product. So I, I encourage everyone to really look into that. I think it, it, it's a good synergy. Okay, you know, I have to do release planning and all that stuff. So that's part of the product. So uh, uh, scaled agile framework is, is in less, I like large scale scrum a little bit better. A lot of people are now coming up with different alternatives to scrum, uh, which I know Jeff Sutherland loves, but there's different worlds out there now. And, and we did lean software engineering many years ago. But we still, all of them, we still did this kind of thinking. We still, whether it's a sprint plan or iteration, but we still had release plans. We still had visions, product visions and roadmaps, and they all were interconnected. We didn't go off and do things that was not part of the strategic plan. Okay. And we had different people the middle management and senior management that were responsible for each one of these things, each one of these decisions, these priorities, and 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 developing the details around it. So I think all of you know that. This is the vision and the roadmap. You know, there's a lot of variations between that, but I put this in here because we've got to make sure that our product vision and our product roadmap is the singular reality that we're all working toward. It's gotta be connected. Okay, so this is important. Prioritization, how many of you all do prioritizations really well, where you prioritize all the work that comes in and everyone does it right and there's no problems, anybody? <laughs> we try. <laughs> Yeah, there's yeah, there's no perfection here. So it's it's really about getting the right people together in a room and weighing the trade-offs. Okay, emerging versus emergency, right? You're always gonna have crap that comes up and stuff that you gotta do that you didn't plan for and you didn't think about, and it's an emergency, right? Here's the key that I find that most companies or organizations don't do. They don't stop something. I got an emergency that I have to go do this. I have X amount of people and X amount of capacity. Well, we got to make them do both. If they have to work 80 hours a week, I don't care. How many of you experienced that? Oh, come on. Silence? It's really common. It, yeah. it, I mean, I just had this conversation, I think yesterday with someone. I said, you just keep adding more stuff, but you're not finishing anything. Exactly. Exactly. So when you talked about four, about, cost, you know, about uh, the developer team or the team understanding the customer and everything, this is the other aspect of that, where the team kind of says, hey, stop it. I'm going to stop you from hurting me. This is not sustainable. I We will riot as a team in a nice way. But management has to take responsibility. This, this, this crap can't happen anymore. So that's very important. Just the rationalization where everyone knows you have to prioritize. And these are influencers to prioritization. So a lot of people, I, I hate to say this, but a lot of people do what I call fake prioritization, 
well, I'm going to put some number on it and we're going to, you know, just wing it. I'm saying, no, there has to be real data behind the prioritization. Why are you, why is this more important than this? Is it going to increase customers? Is it going to re, uh, reduce OPEX? Is it going to uh, improve CapEx realization? I mean, no, there has to be some real numbers behind it. They'll be making this shit up as you go. You're hurting people doing that. That's your job to figure this out. And people don't like that when I say it. So the business value, you know, you have to have real numbers behind that. It can't be a one or two or a five. What the frick does that mean? And I will I won't mention the framework that says that. So there's actual measurements. So when I people say, well, Jay, what should we measure? Are you kidding me? There's actual measurements out there that you can do. There's financial measurements. Here they are. You can do that. Well, Jay, we don't know this. Well, go experiment and go figure it out. Go find the data. I just told you all how much data we have now. There's data galore. We have Gen AI now. We have AI that can go out and get you this data. You can also then analyze the data and do analytics to help get empirical results to make the decision. Then you can determine then based on those data and those decisions, your investment categories and how you're going to do the work. You can then also measure intangible benefits, not just the financial numbers, but also the numbers around visibility, business value. I think the biggest now around is DEI and how you keep your employees from leaving or not being able to recruit good people. That's good things. Or happiness, your employee happiness. You can actually freaking measure that and do something with it. All right? Then you put the business value in there and you do some Im implicit decisions. Market value, risk reduction, capability building. The big thing that I didn't put in there right now is innovation. You can actually measure innovation now. These are actual data points and analysis you can do. Net present value is still very popular. Scrum Inc. recommends that, but there's others now beyond that NPV. This is another thing I'm trying to pull all this together. Anyone familiar with the integral agile by uh, IC Agile and um, Michael Spade in them? Anyone familiar with that? This is basically a ripoff from them. So in the integral agile world, we look at these four quadrants, just like we talked about with Canavan. And what most companies do, they focus on the upper right quadrant, agile practices and tools. We're gonna to get really good at this. They forget about the agile humanity, agile mindset, or the, not forget, they don't harmonize it. They don't harmonize the current culture and organization in the current state. And they don't organize the agile environment. This is the supply chain and the external customer set and market. You have to harmonize all three of these things, four of these things, four of these things for our agile transformation and, and product transformation to work. Okay. That's a lot of work. And uh, it will not always work as well as you think. And I call it agile ethnography. Anyone familiar with ethnography? So uh, ethnography is part of cultural anthropology. We go out and actually study the culture and society and think of the corporate world. You're studying the culture and organizational structure and the people involved in that, just like you would study primates. Okay, so it's very important that you keep that up.
in mind. This is just an adoption roadmap. This is a whole list of stuff you can go out. You can do research, I suggest. Do research on, if you don't know Roman Pitchler, do that and do his product vision and so forth. Research on uh, Silicon Valley Product Group and Marty Kagan. Mick Kirsten did the book. Now he's at Plan, Plan View, he's the CTO there. Uh, IT Revolution, great. Um, another good book that just came out. It's a new book. I suggest you get it and read it. You have practical examples of how to do things. It's not just a lot of theory. And that's the designing agile orgs, creating agile orgs is a systemic approach, uh, approach by Ramos and uh, Polachinko. I'm, I guess, you know, I'm a less opponent, uh, not opponent, a less proponent. So I really like their product organization from um, Craig Larman and Boss Fodi. Uh, so again, that's it. Any questions? Did I, did I bore everybody? You want to stop sharing, Jay? Yeah. Let me push that button. There you go. There we go. So everyone's still here? <laughs> yes. Any, any questions or any comments? I think you got a lot of questions and comments as you went along. Yeah. How hard do you think it is to get um, management behind the real the real cost to do making some of these changes? I think they don't always realize that they're not going to be the same at the end. Well, it depends on the people and culture you're working with, right? Mm. What's in it for me is always important. Mm. But at the same time, I find getting personal, having that interpersonal experience with people and finding out what, what ticks and what their aspirations and goals are. I find out that most executives and leaders have positive intent they want to do the right thing right not only so that they can make their bonuses and money but also whatever their product or value they're providing to society and is they believe in it mm -hmm. right however if you find that they don't i would suggest you go somewhere else um i think having those communication with them about what their desire is what their vision is how do they what do they think about how they're going to reach that vision what's their journey ask them also ask them well do, do you have anything that's inhibiting you from mm. reaching this goal how can i help you overcome some of the the challenges or or thinkings that you have, and then sometimes you got to bring people in to help uh, with that, you know, change or transformation. I don't. I, I can't answer the question because it's, it it really depends. No, no, you you you're you're right. I just um, I I guess I, I'm struggling with it right now. So I, of, I'm in the middle of it. Yeah. One of the phrases that. One of the phrases that Kent Beck used repeatedly, he had come up with this, but uh, the, the I, I, adopt, I adopted it from him, uh, which is the phrase, how's that working for you? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you know, I think I have uh, used that sometimes, yes. Yeah, there's a lot of magical thinking. There's, there's a lot of magical thinking of, oh, uh, you know, we can, uh, you know, Jay, Jay said, you know, you got to stop doing some things. We're going to do some, some emergent <clears throat> things or some, some uh, critical things at the last minute. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of thinking of, oh, well, we can just push that into, you know, we can, we can, 
you know, the, the team will just rise up and do more. And uh, and the the phrase I've come up for, with for that one is that adding paper to a printer doesn't make it print faster. I, I might I might be using that in the next few days. I I I, I shared it widely for that reason. <laughs> I think it's a really useful metaphor because people just immediately get it. It's like oh. Okay, so this is like a so you're like a printer, not like what's in my brain about how this works, but it's like a printer doesn't print faster when you add paper to it. Oh, and it, and it, and you, and and then the you know how's that working for you? So going back to well, what did you do before? Oh, you know when we went back to waterfall and said, well, you know, um. Uh, okay, so you had this six month project. How long did that take? Two and a half years. Oh, how's that working for you? And, and, and yeah. going, you know, going back to historical events is really helpful. Uh, Stephen, you've uh, you've had your hand up for a, a little bit. Oh, sure. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. So I really appreciate this um, question. I, I work for a large healthcare company here in, in the states, and the digital organizational part of it is is moving to Marty Kagan's product model. They're probably about three years into a five-year transformation there. The rest of the organization is not fighting the fact they have to come off waterfall. Basically, they realize the only thing that what they would use waterfall is basically building a hospital or something like that. But the they're using safe. They're choosing to most of them are choosing to use safe. I'm the, sorry. The, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> the struggle there, though, is can you blend successfully? You, I see safe working if you're a mature organization, like, right? You get empowered teams and you can start to use some of those best, better practices. However, is there a way that you can blend that design thinking, that product thinking, empowered teams perspective that Marty has into safe? Can you bring the two together somehow? Well, Marty will tell you no. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and Greg Warman will tell you no. And Bob, but I have done it. So at Wells Fargo, okay. B of A, at State Farm, and here I'm working at Lilly. We're 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 having to blend that because you know that's where they're at now, right? I can't just strip that away from them because some of them have been successful at at applying that. But now we're moving on. Right. So the way mm -hmm. I look at it is, OK, that's cool. You've done this. You you, you made this up, uh, outcome and you use that. That's cool. But like everything in life, there's new ways. More optimized and modern ways to look at things. Right. Mm -hmm. So always keep like I said before, always keep your mind open to new ways like, like Gen AI. You know, that came. And now people have to adopt it, right? You, if you don't adopt that now, you're you're screwed, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's the way I look at it now. Okay, well, that's good. So here's a new thing called FAST, fast. There's a new thing called less. It's a, let's look at that and experiment with that and see if that will get us uh, to the next level, right? Okay. Okay. That's with, helpful. With yeah. Regard, we're, we're... regard to safe, Stephen, mm -hmm. um, so... I, I'm no fan of safe. And in fact, right. I thought there was no hope for safe whatsoever until I heard a presentation uh, actually in Seattle by a, an Australian consultant, uh, M. Campbell Pretty, who's written a book. Yeah. Called oh, yeah. 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 We've, had, we've had M. Campbell Pretty um, uh, on, our, on our stage, so to speak, uh -huh. um, uh, before, but the, she brings her tribal unity and then she's got another book on uh something about the tra you know the train or the tracks or the yeah <laughs> you know you know, she got a very safe specific one yeah. but it's really bringing the humanity into safe and and that's the that was the piece that i see so seldom incorporated into safe mm -hmm. um implementations and, and and you can say you know it's not so often incorporated into Scrum or or um, or other practices either. So um, you know bringing bringing that humanity in is is you know, it goes back to where Jay started. Yeah, I agree. 
where we're struggling a little bit is like the digital side has product coaches. They don't have, they have agile coaches on the other side with safe. And um, we have, uh, I have an agile coaching background um, working with, you know, the product model and, and, and been for a couple of years now with digital, but um, um, it's just interesting um, how the two are split. I would, and, and the, and the, the organization moving from waterfall is finding safe is a little easier because it's more prescriptive. Yeah. Whereas Mar Marty's methods aren't exactly prescriptive, right? He doesn't give you the blueprint. He just gives you the ideas and the concepts and lets you go from there. And so we, you know, it's, it's a, yeah. I'm sorry. I, he ha you have to think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, true. <laughs> but sometimes that's hard for an organization, very large organization that yeah. is not a software company, right? Moving out of waterfall, wanting to go that direction and, and uh, you know, struggling in that arena. So, well, By the way, I, I have quoted Marty Kagan's, um, is, I think it's Marty Kagan's article about safe was the, the revenge of the project managers. <laughs> like I do not know how many times I've copied that and forwarded that to other people, but okay. I'm, I'm willing to be converted. Yeah. Well, so as, as Jay said, less or large, large scale scrum or, or fast even. Yeah. Every time I turn around, there's a new thing of unfix is another one. Someone, you know, an agile to, there's always someone trying to better, uh, build a better mousetrap. Right. Right. And, and and I always say, well, should we should we take this team over here and experiment with it and see mm -hmm. if that, you know, results in anything, right? For our company and our organization and our culture. Where I work, you know, in a pharmaceutical company, we have a lot of scientists. And they're scientific thinking, scientific method, and so forth. So the more we can talk in those terms and say, oh, okay, here's the method, the process and all, then they they get it, right? And then we're bringing tech into there to say, oh, how can we automate your scientific process to do better molecular, 3D molecular development, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, okay, okay. Now, now I can get, okay, we're gonna do this iterative inquiry. I use different terms. I don't try to use the terms from these, frameworks necessarily, but I say, okay, let's figure out how we can do this iteratively. How many experiments can we have? How many prototypes can we have? So I try to, you know, use terminology and concepts that not too foreign to them. Sure. sure. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's been great. Yeah. Cool. And uh, so what do we, we have nothing in January, right? Uh, not yet. Not, not yet scheduled. Yeah. So if anyone we, have, we do have one coming up on March sixth. Yeah. We're going to have Johanna Rothman and her co-author Mark Kilby um talking about it's not posted yet. Uh let me let me see if I can grab the uh the uh context of this quickly. I think they're talking about sexual dysfunction. Yeah, uh, no doubt. Uh, from chaos to successful distributed agile teams. Oh, that's close. <laughs> which, which book they wrote in 2019, before the pandemic. So uh, we're looking for, you know, what have they what have they learned since then, and uh, and how can they guide us? Cool. And they wrote a specific to agile teams, which is pretty rare in the distributed team conversations that I've seen. Yeah. S say that again, Ron, please. W what's rare? Uh, 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 applying, uh, uh, writing about distributed teams specific to agile teams. So distributed agile teams. And, I think it's always been, a, it's been kind of been a, that they were co-located, right? At least before. Yeah, uh, so they were they were in 2019 writing about teams that were distributed, not co-located, um, even before the pandemic. So, uh, panel, I'm not sure whether that answers your question because I, I we were talking. Yeah. Sorry, that's fine. 
Yeah. Hey, hey, Rick, I had a question. You said that you're moving away from Scrum. Did I hear that right? Or maybe I misinterpreted what you said. Uh, who are you asking? Me? Uh, no, Rick. Rick. Jay, Jay, sorry, Jay, hey. Jay, sorry. Oh. Jay, sorry, sorry, Jay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so there are people out there. So if you look up, uh, Alan Hollub or, or uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. others, you know, they, they wrote a book called Agile 2, and they are anti scrummers. Okay. And they have a lot of, they listed everything of why, you know, scrum is not cool. And they have an alternative. And then if you look at it, back in the day, I don't know if you, Recall uh, lean software engineering and mm -hmm. on Papa Dick and all of them. Mm -hmm. That's basically what they're saying is that Scrum is is uh, not providing the value or it's not an optimized way to do our work. So they're recommending a different approach. Surprise. Well, wouldn't that wouldn't that really depend on the maturity of your team? Well, according like, to them, no. Most of, most, of, most of the objections I see to Scrum and to anything else has has anything else except for maybe safe. But most of the objections I see to to, to Scrum and to Kanban and to um, uh, traditional Agile, the objections are really about Scrum, but. They're about Scrum in name only. They're about Scrum practices without the Agile mindset. Mm -hmm. and, and Scrum's intended to be an Agile process. It's not that it supports an Agile, Agile values, principles, and mindset. And um, uh, Scrum, and, and, and so there's an argument to be made that it's really easy to take Scrum and it's even easier to take safe and not be Agile at all. And I think that's that's what a lot of the objectors are trying to come up with is something that's a that's a little harder to not do it in an agile way. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So look up Agile too. There, there's a bunch of stuff out there on that, and and you can read it. But they 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 do have strong arguments. They have a rationale, and they have detail on how to do their thing. Now, Alan Holub will tell you that you should not have a backlog longer than the next sprint. Wow. Because, yeah, but... the, because the next sprint is going to reveal what you should do next. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I, I wonder how Alan would work. There. I've, I've, I've heard a number of his presentations, but... You know, sometimes I wonder how he'd work in an organization that's a public company that has a board of directors that, you know, that's looking for, hey, you know, so so what's your going to be your revenue and profit in the next quarter? I, uh, I I need certainty. How do you how do you integrate those two things? And I and I. And I yes. Think, yes. Yeah. It's the balancing act. Yeah. So, Ron, I haven't talked to you in a while, but basically I, I work um, doing product coaching at Ford, and now I'm working with the Metropolitan Transit Authority. Hmm. It's governed. I mean, the board of directors has like governor of New York on it or something like that. You know, like she she dictates a lot of stuff. So, yeah. Oh, trying to MTA, out. Is, MTA is New York City's. New York City. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah, they don't they can't be that agile. <laughs> <laughs> not, not anytime soon. Right. No, no, no. It's yeah, it's. I get it. Right, and, and and that's what the point I was trying to make. You know, you gotta you gotta meet people where they're at, what they can do, what they can't do, and then you have to adjust and adapt accordingly. Right? There's no one one size fits all. You know, but you can't. But you can. So the one of the interesting things is the most one of the most radical, agile, um, approaches that I've known is fast. And fast yeah, has two yeah. day. I'm going to call them sprints, although they won't call them that, and they they would object if I did. 
but I'm going to call them that two day. They have two day sprints in which teams reorganize every two days. Holy moly. In order, in order to, and, and guess where they did that? They invented that at Blue Cross. Wow. Yeah, wow. But they didn't invent it across the whole company. They invented it in one, one department. And actually what they were building was internal products. And they had five product managers and they had 60 developers and, and they did fast. They, they reinvented their teams every two days. And so, you know, so, you know, what works for, you know, that, that, uh, it, worked, it didn't work for every, they had, I think they had four or five tradition, I think they had four or five COBOL developers <laughs> to use my previous comment. Uh, they had four or five very traditional developers who really didn't want to do this. And so they just assigned them to something, but everybody else was really eager to, it was a sort of an open space. Actually, they refer to it as applying open space, like, like Agile Open is done where you know you you invent all of the talks when you come to the to the conference or or product, or product camp for that matter um, well, they 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 apply open space to their work and here are the five most important things to work on let's let's identify the who who should be on the five teams to work on those for the next two days yeah, yeah. So, so, so at MTA we have unionized um, developers yeah, that won't work. <laughs> <laughs> Unionized developers. Okay. Yeah, it's it's hilarious. It's just been a really big learning experience, and the best thing about it is December twenty second is the last day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow! Cool. Ah. It's been fun. It's been a fun year, but yeah. yeah. Well, that's cool. Well, we're going through a huge transformation here at Lilly and what's interesting is the executives business and the tech leaders have consensus on how they're going to go forward now they have significant goals uh, and huge changes and transformations they want to do but you know you know we're going to see if we, we make it but to your point, you know, they've got together and they say, yeah, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to take the chance. Uh, this is what we want to do uh, to make a huge difference. Mm. So we'll see where, where it goes. And I've, and, and I've had those, you know, those, uh, I, I've been lucky to work with parts of NASA at the time and parts of IBM and parts of other organizations where they were there or that, that pivotal moment. And they had the right leader. Right, and right. Said, we're gonna we're gonna take the chance and do it, right? Yeah. Well, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna duck out. That was my husband coming yeah. in. He has uh, talked. And I and I, and I think it's <laughs> eight, 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 until, eight, one minute until eight o'clock. So let's. Yeah. What one question, Jay? I'm just curious about what you said. So, did they have the burning platform to to was it was there a burning platform to drive that change? Now, what's interesting, the leaders here created the burning. So, uh, uh, oh, they're deciding to change the biopharmaceutical industry and the FDA for the betterment of society. So, so, so the leader created the burning platform yeah. and got everyone to buy in that it was real. Yeah. So, for example, I don't know if you all know this, but for a pharmaceutical company, it takes on the average eight years. Yeah, mm -hmm. for a molecule to be developed to get to a human being, whatever the disease state is, they want to reduce that to four years. That's a significant challenge. They're going to have to work with societies, not just the United States and the FDA, but the EU, China, and Japan governments and regulatory organizations to even come close to making that fundamental change. Understood. Understood. Okay, now it uh, is eight o'clock. Yeah. Oh. Thank and you so uh, much. Excellent it's talk. It's eleven o'clock in Indianapolis. <laughs> so we should probably stop the recording. Mm-hmm.